Fox Media, which is in our book room, and he will be around again with another commercial after his uh, speech and four autographs, if anybody wants to get autographs. He's going to be addressing us today on theocracy versus democracy, the political uses of religion. And I have to say, in all the things that I've read over the years, when I came to uh, Michael Parenti's works, I finally really found somebody that I agreed with, and the same goes for Dr. O'Hare on this particular subject, and not alone that we agreed with, but somebody who was willing to actually say it out loud, who put it right out in a book somewhere uh, for somebody to see. And I think you'll find what he has to say uh, very interesting. Michael Parenti. Thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, for uh, having me here today. Um, a few years ago, I, w I went on a yoga retreat in the Caribbean, a little island. Uh, it's an ashram where people practice yoga. I went because I like yoga. Um, unfortunately, this microphone in front of me. Can you, can you all hear me all right? Back, back there in the cheap seats, you can hear me? OK. Unfortunately, the head, the head of the whole, this yoga sect was there, the head swami, a uh, very religious man, and um, he gave sermons every morning, which the guests were required to attend. And every day he talked about love and the higher cosmic force of love. And, and he ta every day he talked about how spiritual things are everything and material things are nothing. Um, he was an Indian. He used to say, spiritual things are everything, material things are nothing. And then one day, his yacht was un got loose from the, from the pier, and it began to float away. And he started to scream and, 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 and say, get my yacht, get my yacht. And he had a yacht, and he had a seaplane. And this man of love, I noticed, was filled with hate. He yelled at people. This man of, of, of God was, was full of ego. He got up and talked about how no one is perfect, only I am perfect. Um, he kicked out a couple of people from the place because they raised some questions, and he threatened to bring the police in. And it occurred to me that this Swami was the perfect theocrat, that what we had here was a theocracy using the power of the state to enforce your will and, and, and countenancing no alternative opinions um, and up to your ears in wealth. Uh, in a theocracy, there's no democracy. Now, religionists say that they're anti-materialist. They're against materialism. But that word materialism is a very funny one. It's subject to a number of misinterpretations. In fact, there are two real, quite different uses for the word. There's, there's philosophical materialism, which argues, as you know, that ideas do not exist as independent forces, independent of material reality, as disembodied mystical forces. As, as the, the great materialist Karl Marx said, uh, men sometimes get ideas in their head and they're so vivid that they then impute to these ideas an external existence of their own as some force out there. Now the, spiritual, now the religionists, to be sure, are, are anti-materialist in that sense. That is, they believe in these spirits and they even, well, they believe in these externalized imaginings. But there's a second use of the word materialism and that has to do with, and we, when we use it, we often use it, I think, instinctively, quite correctly. We associate it with consumerism, self-interest, power, possessiveness, what I would call acquisitive materialism. And now here, most religious organizations really are, are very dedicated to this kind of materialism. They acquire, throughout the centuries, they have acquired, and in many different cultures, in many different countries, in many different eras, the one thing all these religions have had in common, almost all of them, is that they have acquired vast properties and wealth, and they have used political power. They've used the legitimated authority of the state the legal use of organized force and violence, which is Max Weber's definition of the state, they've used political power to advance their own material interests, to win gain for themselves, to exploit people, and in fact to maybe often win advantages over competing religious sects, because there are often fights between each other for, uh, 
for who's going to grab the goodies. Um, and for centuries, they've been involved in secular intrigues, in conflicts, in wars, in ways that have often violated their own religious precepts. Let me give you just one example from the thousands of examples from history that I could give you. Martin Luther. Now, we all know the Martin Luther who started the Reformation with his anti-materialist rebellion against Rome. But there's another lesser known Luther, the other materialist kind of Luther, the apologist for the German princes, the defender of the aristocratic class rule, the Martin Luther who in 1525, when the peasants were starving, when their land had been taken, when they couldn't even get a decent amount of firewood to heat themselves, when their children were going hungry, when the rents were crushing them, and they were desperate and they rose up in rebellion in 1525 and they took over the cathedrals and they took over the castles and they formed committees and they reorganized the use of the wealth and they reorganized the use of the land for themselves and they rose up with dignity. That Martin Luther got up and this is what he said. He said, this is a blasphemy. He cursed the rebellion for turning, quote, everything upside down like the worst disaster. By the way, his own prince, his own prince, Frederick the Wise, says this. Let me quote him first. He said, in many ways, the poor folk have been wronged by the rulers. Take something when a prince admits that. And now God is visiting his wrath upon us. But not Luther. Luther knew which side God was on, and God is on the side of the aristocracy. And he said, he quote, I don't quote him, is everything upside down like the worst disaster. And Martin Luther repeatedly urged, quote, everyone who can to, quote, smite, slay, and stab the peasants, secretly or openly, remembering that nothing can be more poisonous, hurtful, or devilish than a rebel. It is just as when one must kill a mad dog. And of course, he quoted numerous passages from the Bible to justify his call to butchery. And the German princes didn't need too much encouragement. They slaughtered 100,000 peasants. Historians agree that that's pretty much the estimate that could stand. So this Luther, the great spokesman for the one true God of love and the Prince of Peace, was up to his neck in homicidal bloodletting in a repressive class war on the side of those who have more than they know what to do with against those who want a fair shake. This materialist, um, <clears throat> now sometimes it works the other way. Sometimes the religionists use the state to advance their interests. That's what we mean by the religious uses of politics. And sometimes the state uses religion uh, to, to legitimate its own exploits, and that's the political uses of religion. So politicians use religion, and religionists use politicians. <clears throat> this is not to say that nothing's changed. Indeed, there have been remarkable historical developments over the centuries. There have been remarkable victories for our forces. There's been a rollback of theocratic power. I mean, compared today to the 10th century, let's say. The diminishment of religious wars in the West and the secularization of social life with the advent of science and with such forces as industrialization, urbanization, and modern socialism. But these advances don't come, and history doesn't work in a neat historical succession. Just when we think it's going one way, much to our dismay, it starts going another way. And, but, but generally, the, the move has been in a positive direction. But remarkable residues of the past are still with us. When you think about it, it was just 30 years ago that there existed an age-old theocracy. I mean, I mean, a theocracy that was about 2,000 years old. I mean, kept or the society was still organized that way in Tibet. And when the People's Republic of China reclaimed its citizenry over Tibet and sent its, its troops in and its organizers and its uh, social welfare people, all these, all these people came in, the US media were filled with stories about these beautiful monks who had to be carried to India who are now deprived of their religion. They weren't deprived of their religion. You could practice Buddhism in China if you want. What they were deprived of was their enormous wealth. The thing that the media didn't tell us about was that in Tibet, those monks ruled that country. Those peasants lined up and gave their food, their livestock, everything else. They exploited that peasantry. Those monasteries were rich. 
It was, a, it was a feudal theocracy that lived off the backs of these peasants, and those monks had a good thing going for them, and that class was blown away. What the media doesn't also tell you now is that the average peasant in China, for whatever else you want to think about or say about the People's Republic of China, the average peasant in Tibet today goes to school, he gets, a, he gets enough to eat, his kids get enough to eat, he's got a co-op, a communal farm, whatever it is to work on, he's got some place to go to, he gets medical attention when he needs it. And those things did not exist when God ruled in Tibet. We also could note how theocracy, I mean this thing about the, this, this erratic quality of religion sometimes, I know you're out there behind those lights, but I'll just go on, this is show busy, you gotta... Uh, how, how you can get these erratic movements when the, one of the most murderous and repressive theocracies emerges today in the last eight or nine years in Iran with mullahs, uh, and by the way, the right-wing faction of the Shiite movement uh, won a victory in Iran. You know, when they blew up all those mullahs and those guys who came for a mass meeting, that, that was the sort of the Mujahideen, the reformist group. They were all slaughtered in one blow. Uh, the mullahs who rule in Iran and live off the people and live very well and are carrying out this endless murderous war against Iraq with the assistance of uh, with our, our, our cowboy in the White House there. Um, so we have this kind of thing. And also right here in America, as the previous speaker pointed out, there has been a real resurgence of this religious right. Um, for generations, religionists have served corporate capitalism. They've preached obedience to the status quo. They've opposed workers trying to organize and form unions. They've opposed syndicalism, socialism. It was portrayed as the work of the devil. And in turn, capitalists, the big rich robber barons and the owners, were inclined to present themselves as the recipients of the deity's highly selective blessings. Let me quote one of them. John D. Rockefeller Sr., quote, I believe the power to make money is a gift of God. Having been endowed with the gift I possess, I believe it is my duty to make money and still more money and more money and more money and more money. <laughs> and to use the money I make for the good of my fellow man according to the dictates of my conscience. So from this we may conclude that God is a financier. <laughs> and so too today, uh, 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 social and political leaders uh, constantly call upon God. Every president of the United States feels compelled to do this, but no president more so than Ronald Reagan. And it's a little scary. You know, it's one thing for certain right-wing evangelicals to announce that the Bible prophesizes an, an imminent apocalypse, that we are now in the third and final stage, the third and final millennium. That the Antichrist forces from the East, as portrayed by Gorbachev and Mikhail uh, uh, in Russia, uh, will, will meet destruction, Israel will convert, and Christ will return triumphant to deliver death upon the non-believers and elevate the believers up to eternal life into heaven. It's one thing to hear that from Jerry Falwell and Jimmy Swaggart. It's quite something else when the President of the United States, the guy with his finger on the button, tells us or, or, or is indicating that he embraces the same mythology, that we may be getting close to the apocalypse, the final judgment between, between East and West. And, he, and, and, it's, and it's a matter of public record that he's entered into such conversations about this impending apocalypse with Jerry Falwell and other fundamentalists who themselves have talked about it and his wonderful grasp of the Bible and uh, how the president really knows all this stuff. Before the National Association of Evangelics in March 1983, President Reagan pro proclaimed, quote, there is sin and evil in the world and we are enjoined by scripture and the Lord Jesus to oppose it with all our might. The Soviet Union is an evil empire, unquote. And the United States nuclear arm race against the Soviets is, quote, a struggle between right and wrong, good and evil. So God, it seems, is a Cold War militarist who is preparing us for a final nuclear confrontation. A lot of this, of course, was said before the Soviets kept coming and putting everything on the table and saying, come on, let's negotiate and all that. And, and, and millions of people got out there and demonstrated and said, get, go to Geneva and all that sort of thing. He's been dragged kicking and screaming to Geneva. And so now he looks like he's interested, but he has managed to avoid any single arms agreement up to now. And he may very well avoid any arms agreement. 
Um, well, they say that the Russians are scared of Reagan, and I don't doubt it because so are many Americans. Um, <clears throat> It's one thing when the fundamentalist Reverend Bailey Smith, then president of the Southern Baptist Convention, tells a right-wing political rally that God, quote, does not hear the prayer of a Jew. God is an anti-Semite, turns out. That is, that is, that is after he converted. Uh, <laughs> it's something else when the president of the United States announces that the United States is, quote, a Christian nation. And this surely must come as news to a loyal citizenry, which includes over six million Jews, several million Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists, and millions upon millions of atheists, agnostics, skeptics, and non-sectarian deists, who together probably compose a majority of our people. Um, it's, it's something when, when Reagan gets up there at his State of the Union message and says, this country and our constitution could not have been formulated without divine guidance. So I sit there and I'm saying, so God is not only our father, he's our founding father. As a matter of fact, the, the Constitution is very clear on this. The framers at Philadelphia left the deity very much out of it. And when Benjamin Franklin suggested that their daily sessions should open with the prayer, asking for divine guidance, they voted it down. And Alexander Hamilton said, we don't need foreign aid. Um, <laughs> the Constitution is very clear that ours is not a Christian nation. Article 6 reads, quote, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. And by the way, that was a distinct and democratic advance for one who has a very critical view and of the Constitution who feels it wasn't a very democratically motivated Constitution. Let's say that was a democratic victory for the people. It was even ahead of, of many state constitutions which in those days banned Jews, Catholics, and non-believers from holding public office. <clears throat> and of course, the most democratic victory came not with the founding fathers, but with the concession they had to make. They were forced to make because of those democratic forces, and that was the Bill of Rights. When Colonel Mason of Virginia got up and said, let's have a Bill of Rights, that was voted down almost unanimously. I think Massachusetts abstained. Uh, um, later on, they realized their tactical error, and they realized if they wanted to get this thing uh, ratified, and if they're going to win some kind of popular support for it, they'd better give the people something besides what they gave themselves in the Commerce Clause and all those other goodies and bills and credits and all the other stuff for themselves. They had to give the people something, and they put through a Bill of Rights with, with the First Amendment. Yet, the Reagan Justice Department is taking a regressive road back toward theocracy. A, ruling that the government can spend taxpayer money to subsidize religious schools. B, supporting a move to amend the Constitution so as to allow teacher-led prayer sessions in public schools. And C, pressuring the religionist crusade against safe and legal abortions. Now, here again, here again we watch, we're, we're, we're witnessing not only the religionist use of politics, but the, but the politicians' use of religion. Take that last issue of abortion. These guys don't care one way or another about abortion. As a matter of fact, they had the opposite position. As a matter of fact, conservatives for years supported legal abortion because their view was that the poor had too many babies and there was too many kids on welfare, so let's have abortions, get rid of those kids. That was their position for years. Ronald Reagan, when he was governor of California, he signed the most, most liberal abortion bill in the world. And his, and his daughter had an abortion, didn't buy them at all. George Bush supported legal abortions. They've all changed now, they've all come over. And why they came over? Because they found political gold in that area. Because Richard Vickery got up and said, hey, this is how we can split the Democratic Catholic vote. Hey, this is how we can win more of the Protestant fundamentalist vote. And Vickery even said it. When Reagan appointed Sandra O'Connor, he said, is she soft on abortion? We cannot give up this issue. This issue helps us split the Democrats. I mean, it is the crassest, crassest case of political opportunism. Once more, as in Luther's day, using religion as an instrument of maintaining your power, religion as an instrument of class control. And Reaganism has brought forth not only the politically more conservative religious spokesmen, but also the theologically more reactionary ones. 
those who evade all real social issues. You can watch these guys on television all day. You'd never know there was something called pollution or acid rain or poverty or exploitation or unemployment or inflation or unfair tax laws, ruinous tax laws. You never get a sense of that. You never get a sense that people are desperate, fighting, trying to stay ahead of themselves, wondering how they're going to get through their old age. You never get any of that. All you know is that you're to blame, you're weak, and all you got to do is open up your heart to Jesus and it'll all be saved. It'll all be worked out. They have no attention to poverty, oppression, to militarism. What they do is focus on personal pieties, sectarian intolerance, and a kind of prudish, prudish, repressive moralism. In the face of all the things we have to struggle with today, they're targeting Playboy magazine. Their message is the same as it's been for centuries, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Don't organize and struggle for social justice and against the powers that be, against the powers that exploit you, against the powers that take the money out of your paycheck before you can even get it home. Don't, ex don't fight against them. Just trust in God and God's love, and above all, keep those contributions coming in. <laughs> and what a God it is they sell. We already know from reading the Bible that the Judeo-Christian God is vainglorious, sadistic, murderously partisan, vindictive. In fact, if you had an, a person like that, you wouldn't want to associate with him for five minutes, let alone worship him. You might recall that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, including all the unoffending and innocent children and infants in those cities because he didn't like the lifestyle of certain of the citizens and what they were doing. He took great satisfaction when his Israelites acted like imperialists and massacred. Read the Book of Kings where he says, and the Israelites slew 20,000. Well, the first time I read that, I was astonished. I said, my God, and God was pleased. And the Israelites went out and they slew 35,000 and killed them all, and God was happy. I said, my God, what a God, not, not my God. Um, and today it hasn't changed all that much to some degree, this whimsical, murderous God. When Mother Teresa, just last year, when Mother Teresa's plane skid on the runway, killing five of her admirers who were waiting there to receive it and maiming a whole bunch of others, she got off and she said, this was the will of God. And I'm saying to myself, but this God is Caligula. This God is one of the... Or some other homicidal mad despot. We also know that God is a terrorist and an extortionist. Listen to Oral Roberts, who says that God's going to zap me unless they come up with eight million smackers by the end of March. By the way, Oral Roberts made that same plea last year. He said, unless I get it by the end of December 1986, God will take me. And he denied saying it until they produced the tape, the videotape with him saying it. He said, oh, did I say that? Well, I say so many things. Um, <laughs> The truth is, he, he says he frantically needs that $8 million for missionary scholarships. That's a lie, ladies and gentlemen. His financial empire is in serious, <clears throat> serious fiduciary trouble. It's been in trouble for a number of years. And he is going to go under, and that's what he needs that money for. It's not God that's after him, it's the bankers. And what transpires in these money-grabbing forays is something right out of the dark age. In one TV interview I saw, Roberts was sitting there being interviewed, he and his wife were there, and he was explaining his whole appeal to this other guy who was talking to him. This was about three months ago. I saw this on TV, and he said, well, about $3 million come in, and then when the money stopped coming in, Satan appeared. And I'm sitting there saying, what does he mean, Satan appeared? You thought that's bad. Then his wife chimes in. She says, that's right. Satan appeared, and I said, Satan, you get on away here, and you, don't, you leave my husband alone. You get out of here. And Satan, he just ran off like that. And I said, I said, where am I? And the credulous audience actually applauded. And I said, what is this? Where am I? Uh, is this candid camera? What is this? Am I uh, a little Johnny Lollipop in, in Disneyland? Are they talking? I mean, the image of this plucky little woman standing there with perhaps with her rolling pin and chasing off the Prince of Darkness. I mean, it just. It, I mean, this is something. I said, is this the 12th century? Then I thought, they couldn't get away with this in the 12th century. If some priest got up and started talking like that, probably the, the, the courier would call him up and say, what are you, hey, what's this you're selling? Because they have a monopoly on those kind of contacts. Um, on another occasion, I saw Jimmy Swaggart 
on TV, fulminating, you know, and going and, and, and twitching his frenetic bulk across the stage back and forth. And he paused at one moment and he says, hold on, hold on, as if a celestial long distance phone call suddenly came and said, God is calling me and God is telling me something. And then he, and then he stopped and then he told them what it was. I forget, I didn't write it down. But, um, and I'm sitting there and saying, I can't believe it. This guy actually now claims that he got this message and they're sitting there believing this, you know? I'd like to do, can I do an experiment here, please? Would you all just put your hands up like this? Just put your hands up a second. Close your eyes, wave them a little bit. Do you feel, do you feel it coming down in your hands? <laughs> well, I'm working a much harder room than Jimmy Swaggett did, you know? But it doesn't work. I don't have it down yet, all right. <laughs> actually, you're giving me some reassurance. Then there's, of course, Pat Robinson, who, who turned a, a presidential, Republican presidential nominee, who turned a hurricane away from his home state with God's direct intervention. And God, if he's anything, is a meteorologist. Um, there's the Baptist minister, Everett Sullivan. Now, this guy ran, he ran in the Republican primary for governor in Nebraska. Four candidates, he came in fourth. And a woman won. And worse, to make matters worse, the Democratic nomination, a woman run. So here was the Republican gubernatorial race, two women running against each other. So what did Sullivan says? He says, this was a curse, evidence of God's curse. Quote, quotes from the Bible, good, the good book, right? The good book. Jeremiah plainly tells us that when, I'm quoting, I'm quoting Sullivan. Jeremiah plainly tells us that when the people of a nation are willing to accept the leadership of a woman, it is a sure sign of God's curse. Unquote. Talk about a sore loser, huh? <laughs> well, we always knew God was a male supremacist, too. Now, the point I want to make here is, is less a theological one than a political one. It's that the crude religionism of the right, it demonstrates not only the obviously anthropomorphic origin of the God image, but also the exploitative, opportunistic use of religion as an instrument of oppression, as an instrument of material acquisition, as an instrument of political power and political privilege. It is not merely that the God hucksters are silly and superstitious, rather they are keenly self-interested, manipulative, and politically powerful. Not only do the religionists preach pie in the sky by and by, but they live high off the hog here and now. While preaching otherworldliness to their followers, they're up to their ears in the crassest pursuits of wealth, power, class interests, and if we can, uh, if we can believe what's happening to Jimmy Baker, other crass pursuits. <laughs> they talk about doing good for others, but they do well for themselves. Um, However, as I say, although history moves, and I'll sort of wrap it up here, although history moves in fitful and often uncertain steps, the general thrust has really been forward. Important democratic victories have been won. Theocratic forces still menace us. They enjoy unexpected resurgence, but they no longer rule over the Western world the way they once did. Even the Mullah theocracy in Iran is not as successful as it thought it would be in exporting the Ayatollah's fanaticism throughout the Middle East. And even the Reaganite political religionist revivalism is not really doing all that well, neither in Congress, nor in the courts, nor in elections and primaries, nor in the public opinion surveys. Jesse Helms had to quit that big uh, filibuster he was doing for school prayer and all that because it wasn't getting anywhere because the, uh, uh, the response, even from his own state, where people, people are hurting for real, you know, they're losing their farms and this guy's sitting up there talking this hocus pocus. He had a retreat on that issue. Um, also today in about a third of the world, in existing socialist countries, in communist countries, the oppressive, horrible, totalitarian Congress countries, the theocracy has been thoroughly vanquished. Which is not to say that religion is prohibited. Every, every traveler who's gone there, including Billy Graham, says that people are free to practice their religions. I was in Moscow. I was on a tour of political scientists and economists. Um, Fort Greer, uh, another fellow political scientist, sociologist, was on that tour. He can testify. We went into a church, and there were all these people, Russian Orthodox Church. They were praying and going on. The priest was. And I said, well, if this state is repressing this religion, it's doing a sloppy job of it, I must say. And, and, uh, and there's freedom for synagogues, churches, for Baptists, Jews, Church of Christ, Roman Catholic denominations. The misrepresentation in the West on this issue, and, it, and it's constant, constant that religion isn't free in, in the USSR or other communist countries, 
And I think it's, it's, it's again, a, a, a use, another political use of the religious issue, because the, for the religionist, communism is a threat. <clears throat> Not, because, not only because atheism is not tolerated, but because atheism has an official status as a creed. And this is what the religionists cannot forgive. The Soviet constitution reads that atheists have the free right to the open and free prop propagation of their creed. The freedom for a atheist creed. And by the way, in so socialist countries, about the only ones I know which explicitly give that constitutional protection to atheists. So it's kind of ironic, you know. In evil totalitarian Russia, atheism has achieved a pluralistic safeguard superior to what is found in our own supposedly democratic pluralistic society. And there's more open, unharassed freedom of belief in communist countries for religious believers than there is for atheists in the USA. We can also w witness a new revolutionary development within the ranks of religion itself, especially in Latin America, with liberation theology. And the threat of liberation theology is that it doesn't diminish man to God, but puts him as the center of God's concern. And it also speaks for uh, the interests of a different social class from the one that religionists usually represent. Liberation theology is not for the theocracy, but against it. It's not for what the French call le prêtre du double menton, the priest of the double chin. It's for the hungry and the immiserated. To the extent that liberation theology has this democratic social content, it represents an historically progressive development, even if we can still disagree with them theologically about things. Um, it sees, instead of conjuring up a god who is the object of pietistic idolatry and interior imaginings, liberation theology say, sees God as, a manifest, as manifest in social justice, in economic betterment for all the people, a more decent life here on earth, so that the lowliest among us shall be among the best, and the parasitic, the exploitative, the oppressors, the plutocrats, the dictators shall be cast aside. That's really a subversive religion. That's really getting close to what Christianity really pretended it's supposed to be about. And also in the USA, there's a Christian left that's developed, it's emerged, uh, which sides with the poor, with the political refugees from fascism and the peace movement, and which does not support the kind of, kind of Reagan restrictions, uh, the kind of breaking down of church and state walls, and the kind of restrictions on other people's creeds. So for some believers, at least, it seems that God is not a jingoist or a militarist or a financier, but he's a pacifist and a progressive and maybe even a revolutionary. So it becomes clear that God is about as good as the people who believe in him, which is understandably so since he is made in their image. Um, my own view on God is the one that's offered by the great American theologian Woody Allen, who once said, <coughs> who once said that maybe God does exist, but he's an underachiever. <laughs> Imagine being omnipotent and producing this, right? Tornadoes, plagues, fascists, all these things. Um, well, what is to be done? Three short points, then I'll sign off, and I'm sure others will have other things to suggest here. Uh, the immediate goals that we might consider worth struggling for, first, we have to get the religionists off welfare. Make the rich churches and the multimillionaire TV evangelists pay a fair share of taxes on their immense holdings and investments. <laughs> We have to get their hands, we have to get their hands, their loving, beseeching hands, we have to get those hands out of our pockets. <laughs> We've got to have them, we have to have, have stop this theocratic rule where the state forces us to subsidize them in their propagandizing of their faith, which is a violation of our beliefs and a violation of the Constitution that is using the state in that way. Not, not, not propagating their faith, they can do that. Second, free thinkers, liberation theologists, atheists, agnostics, etc., should have equal time on television. I, I just wrote a book called Inventing Reality, which deals with the way that political ideas and information are controlled by the news media, but the same thing could be said about creed. Alternative views are systematically shut out. Dissident opinions get no hearing. I mean, occasionally a local radio show, Ma Madeline Murray will be interviewed or some, uh, someone else like that. But for the most part, you could just see 
that it's not a non-secular TV. Dissident opinions get no hearing. There's no free market of ideas. Third, we must roll back Reaganism and its war against the First Amendment and its war against the separation of church and state and against our, our freedom and our, and our beliefs. And that we can... And I think the Reaganites have been weakened by the Iran-Contra scandal, and so there are new opportunities for us to fight back. Not just to complain, but to fight back. And not to feel that they're all so powerful and they're so dangerous. Not, they're dangerous, it's true. But you have to do what the great Italian communist Antonio Gramsci once said. And what Madeleine Murray O'Hare practiced, even though I bet she didn't read Gramsci on this point. He said, you must have a pessimism of the mind, be able to see the worst, the dangers, and an optimism of the will to fight back and know that there are victories that we could win and more and more of them will be ours. Um, this is what we want. Even though some of us may not realize it, we are part of very much of a long historical struggle. We are involved in making history, a little, just a little bit of it, maybe a paragraph was made right out there today. Um, to those who would make the world safe for hypocrisy, we say that our country needs something more than freedom of religion. We need freedom of belief, including the freedom not to believe in spirits and demons without putting our jobs and civil liberties at risk. Our historic task is not to vanquish religion, but to vanquish theocracy, I think, and, and with it, all the abuses and privileges upon which it feeds. This, ladies and gentlemen, would be and it will be a great victory for humanity and for democracy. Thank you. We want to give you an opportunity for a few questions, and I understand that those of you that want to ask questions have to come up here in the middle so that the Houston chapter that's diligently re recording this entire convention can get it on their audio tape. So we have time for a few. We want to get people that haven't asked a question yet, uh, Lewis? Okay, right. Okay. Let's stay up in case nobody else comes up. In view of the fact that the television evangelists continually uh, denigrate atheism and misrepresent it, do you think there is any practical chance that we could bring a lawsuit against them and demand equal time in reality? Um, well, there is the fairness doctrine, and the fairness doctrine has not been applied to atheists or communists or socialists or certain other dissidents. It reads that if any particular policy or position or political belief is, is attacked, that some representative of that belief would have not equal time. Equal time is only for candidates in campaigns. People get those two, uh, those two laws confused. You may not get the same time, but you're supposed to be able to get some amount of time. Let's say they spend a half hour attacking and they might give you five minutes back, but at least five minutes to respond. And, and it hasn't been applied. And that fairness doctrine might be the link where we could maybe have a suit. Or in any case, maybe some kind of legislation which says that all questions of creed also should come under the fairness doctrine. You probably would never get through Congress if you explicitly use the word atheist, but if you said all questions of creed uh, should also be subject to it. The airwaves, you see, the airwaves, the networks don't know this, it seems, but the airwaves do not belong to the networks. They don't belong to CNN. They don't belong to those people. The airwaves are part of the public domain. They are the property of the people of the United States, and they should be used for all the people of the United States. In that sense. Yes. Yeah, my name's Howard Atkins, and I'm from the San Francisco chapter. I am uh, can't hear you, sir. Well, I think everybody here agrees with what you're saying uh, in principle. And when are we going to get organization from a grassroots? Because, I mean, there are the Bakers, the Oral Roberts. This, I think the time is ripe and the iron's hot. When are we going to strike and how are we going to do it in an organized fashion that will have some impact? Because I continually get the feeling that uh, I'm belonging to more of a social club than an activist. And I, I, you know, I, I'm not saying this out of, out of uh, you know, uh, discord, but I'm saying it out of a, a feeling of let's get something organized and let's 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 start some real changes going. 
And how so do we how Madeline do we do Maria that? Madeline Maria is going to answer all those questions and lay all that out in, in, in later on. She told me Good. she would. But but seriously, I'll, I'll say this: that um, yeah, our our political resources are, are very limited. But even the few we have, we often don't use as much as we could. And there are things like writing letters. There are things like uh, asking for time on local media. Local media is a lot more permeable and accessible than the national media is is almost impossible. I've been on national media twice in my life, and, and but lo local radio stations, they'll always have you on and such. Uh, and to do this in an organized fashion, when we see these especially egregious things, not just a lone dissenter, but speaking for an organization, separation of church and state. But I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm sure some of that work is, is, is done, and I guess more of it should be, right? Yes, sir. I have uh, uh, pretty much come to the conclusion that the religionists in this country are uh, getting the upper hand primarily because of 70 years of anti-Sovietism, which is synonymous in the minds of so many people in this country with atheism, and therefore it, in order to hate communism they must hate atheism and therefore they must be religious. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Well, it's true that the anti-communist, anti-Soviet thing is linked to anti-atheism, or even anti-anti-religionism. Um, and um, that's another whole issue. That is another whole issue. And, uh, and, and, and we should be clear. There was an exchange out there on the march, which I thought was bad politics. Someone shouted something about uh, your disgrace to our country. And someone else yelled back, like, uh, what country, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it is our country, too. We don't have to out the center. I mean, this is our country. That's our flag. Uh, uh, and in fact, this is a very American fight we have here. And I think uh, when people do, I, I talk about anti-Sovietism. I think, I think there's a lot of distortion there. I mean. What we have is a non-falsifiable thing that no matter what report we get out of the country, it's negative. So if there are no consumer goods, I say, you see, the system doesn't work. If, they, if they're getting more consumer goods, I, I just read now that 90% of the Soviet people have refrigerators and TV sets. Oh, that's just the leaders buying them off and placating them a little to hold the whole close, you know. If, if, if they refuse to negotiate, they walk out and say, forget it, you, you, you don't, you're not serious about it. We say, see, see, they're aggressive. If they negotiate, if they come forth, I mean, Gorbachev's coming with his tongue hanging out Give, ready to give away the whole store, putting it all on the table to negotiate, then they say, oh, this is a publicity ploy, a little propaganda trick, and, and all that sort of thing. If the churches are empty in, in Russia, they say, oh, you see, religion is oppressed. If the churches are full, they say, oh, you see how the people are turning away from the atheist government and looking for a deeper, finer creed. So anything you say, it cut, they'll have an axe to grind, and some of the, obviously some of the criticisms are true, but, but I, I take a very critical look at that. But I would say to most people, that's another whole discussion, and we're talking about our struggle here in America, and that's what we should be looking at. I'm Frida Kearns from the Philadelphia chapter. So my, my responses tend to get very long, and I see John getting... Right, and I'll try to make them shorter. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I applaud your opinions. I think that's great. What I'd like is, um, I'm active politically, and of course fought against Reagan and working for the Democratic Party. And why doesn't the Democratic Party use all of these uh, things that are happening so that they can get back into power? Do you think that it's really a one-party system in this country? Uh, that's another whole lecture, okay? Uh, l let me just say that, unfortunately, many Democrats are in bed with Republicans protecting some of the same issues in many instances. But, but not all. There are real progressive people. There are people who really do take the First Amendment seriously, and even some in the Republican Party. Um, one last question. You speak against the religious right, and I was horrified to hear you tell us that the religious left isn't too bad. Would it not be better to join instead of with the religious left, join with the atheist right? There are atheists. We do have a voice in the Republican Party. I go there. I'm a state delegate. I've spoken against abortion. Abortion divides the Republican Party almost as badly as it divides the Democratic Party. I was horrified to hear you speak that the religious left is not 
too bad. I'd well, like you to answer that. Well, I, I'm not horrified to hear that you're the atheist right, and I don't really like the right. Uh, I think on this issue of, a, of, of, of b creedal belief, we are together. On the political issues, we are very much divided and apart, that's all. But you don't have to feel horrified, because I, I made a point I made was that what, the, what I found with the liberation theologists is that they were here now. They, were, they don't go to the, I think there's a difference between the priest who comes in and says, Yes, my child, yes, yes. Oh, your, your baby died, and no food, yes. I will trust in God, yes, yes, yes. And the priest who comes in and says, let's take some of the land, let's hear some seed, let's, let's grow some crops for you, let's fight this landlord, let's do that. I just, think, I just think the second guy is better than the first. That's all, don't feel so hard. One last question. My name is Drew Cavalli. I'm from the Sonoma County chapter of the I'm from the Snowy County chapter north of the Gold Gate Bridge, about 50 miles in California. Now, from California. I, want, I want to know, do you think, in your opinion, that President Reagan has the power to press the button to release a nuclear war, or is he controlled very tightly by that group of the religious, military, industrial complex? Can he do it alone? Well, that's a whole question about he's controlled by some cabal. He's part of it. Uh, the, the question is, do you think that Ronald Reagan really has the power to press that button to start a nuclear war, or is he controlled by the religious, military, industrial complex and such? I, I, you know, I don't think he's that controlled by them. I just think he's an inherent part of them. I mean, he, it's not that they manipulate him and he's a mindless puppet. He believes those things, too. He very explicitly does. And as far as starting a nuclear war, the, the person who can start a nuclear war is the President of the United States. He can give a command and issue that command. In fact, he's the only one in our system, which is, by the way, not true of the Soviet system. Gorbachev cannot do it. He would, have to, he would have to get some kind of clearance from the Presidium or the Central Committee or something. He could not, you know, no person, no one individual. Unfortunately, our system, he, he could do that. Whether he'd succeed, whether he gave the order and somebody said, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, and might, you know, talk to someone else is, is another question. Well, thank you very much.